joining us. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Tracy Nguyen. I'm the Youth Engagement Project Coordinator at the California School-Based Health Alliance. Uh, this is our third webinar in our five-part series on smoking, vaping, and different intervention methods. And it's going to be on using motivational interviewing in school-based wellness centers to save time and create closer connections. And um, I'm going to mention this at the beginning of the webinar right now, but also um, towards the end as well. I want to make sure that everyone kind of knows about this, but it's just a friendly reminder that you do not need to attend all five parts of our um, smoking and vaping and different intervention um, methods uh, series. You can join in on this one, even if you have not, um, oh, hi. even if you have not, um, join us for the first two um, webinars. And also basically you can join this one and then um, you can skip out on the fourth one if you can't make it for you know capacity reasons or is just not working with your schedule. And then you can join us again for the fifth one, right? Um, but whatever it is, we'd love to see you join all of us for all parts of our five part series. Uh, and with that, let's just go ahead and jump right in. So I wanna make sure that we're thanking our funder, uh, the California Department of Education Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program uh, for supporting this project and for making this webinar possible. The contents do not necessarily reflect the position or policy of the CDE. And then onto some general housekeeping. Uh, that this webinar will be recorded um, and recording and slides will be posted on our website as well as our um, as well as being emailed to you all. And I also want to mention that there is a group chat there for everyone. Um, so if you are if you have questions throughout the webinar, please make sure that you are putting it in the group chat and there will be a dedicated Q and a time where our presenters will go over. Um, the questions um, towards the end of our webinar. So again, ask questions throughout, but we'll be answering them towards the end of our webinar. And then for folks who don't know about the California School-Based Health Alliance, otherwise abbreviated as CSHA, we are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. And we advocate for more school-based health centers as well as support and improve existing ones. And we do this primarily through policy, capacity building, and providing technical assistance like the webinars that we're putting on today. So if you're interested in learning more about our organization, here's a link. Um, and again, the slides will be shared out to everyone. Um, and on our website, you'll find additional resources as well as other recording and slides of our previous webinars. And I know there is a chat um, asking for previous webinars for our, our, our smoking and vaping and different intervention um, and methods webinar series. So I can definitely link that in after um, a couple more slides. So hang tight, folks. Um, up next, I want to make sure I'm putting our conference on everyone's radar. So CSHA is holding our annual school health, health conference on Monday, April 17th, and hosting an advocacy day on Tuesday, April 18th. Both of these um, events will be taking place in Sacramento. Um, so please put this on your calendar if you don't already have it, and please register if you're interested. And here's the link right here um, for more information and uh, where you can find the actual registration link as well. I also want to mention that at our conference, it's actually where we're going to hold the fourth part of our five-part series on smoking, vaping, and different intervention methods. Um, and the fourth part is actually an in-person workshop at our conference. It will also be on motivational interviewing, but this in-person workshop will be providing CEUs um, and it will go over more of the fundamentals of MI. We'll touch upon it about today as well, but if this is of interest to you as well as other workshops that we have lined up for our conference, we highly recommend and we will be really happy if you can all join us in Sacramento for April 17th as well as 18th for Advocacy Day. With that, I want to go ahead and move on to the next one. So in conjunction with a uh, conference, if you sign up to be a member of our organization, uh, there will be conference registration discount, which is really awesome if you plan on going uh, with more of your peers, your colleagues, people in your organization. Uh, so this is a really great um, perk of our membership. And also, if you sign up to be a member, you will um, get technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. So if this is of interest to you, please sign up um, here at this link. Otherwise than that, I wanna make sure we are 
introducing our presenters for today. So we have two presenters. Uh, the first one uh, who we have here is uh, Vanessa Berti. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, she is the program director for school-based wellness centers with the Humboldt Independent um, Practice Association. Vanessa earned her master's in public sociology through Cal Poly Humboldt. She has worked tirelessly to invest in her community and support system impacted people through developing the re-entry department in the Humboldt County Jail, as well as the Raven Project Drop-In Center for Homeless Youth. Vanessa an associate, is an associate uh, faculty professor for the College of the Redwoods and the Pelican Bay Scholars Program. Vanessa is a poet and a performer. She has a TEDx talk called How to Save a Life, which is uh, in which she shared milestones in her childhood that transformed her to the woman she is today. So that's our first presenter. Our second presenter with us today is Juliet Ferry. So she's a national board certified health and wellness coach at the Priority Care Center in Eureka, uh, where she's worked for the past eight years. She has been in the field of health promotion for almost 20 years, has an MS in exercise physiology, and is a certified exercise physiologist with the American College of Sports Medicine. Her passion is working with people to try to find the small ways that make their lives better. Julia enjoys walking, hiking, backpacking, and mountain biking with her husband, and trying to spend time with her teenage daughter. And with that, I will pass it on to Vanessa and Julia to talk more about how their team uses um, MI principles when talking um, with their young students. I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing here. Juliet, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. We're really excited to share with you our work and provide you with this presentation. We wanted to start this off with a land acknowledgement. Um, here on the North Coast in rural Humboldt County, California, we're the um, current and homeland of several indigenous tribes, including Hupa, Karuk, Matol, Talawa, Wallachi, and Yurok tribes that make up Humboldt County. Um, there's a great website if you're wondering what land you are on called nativeland.ca where you can type in your zip code and find out more about the land that you're on. But indigenous people continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. And they're an important part of not only the history of our area, but of continuing the knowledge of this place and all the places that you all are joining us today from. So I wanted if everybody could just kind of silently think to themselves, how could you manifest this land acknowledgement in your life? What does that look like for you? And I know for me, one way that I manifest that is by when I go camping or go to a park or a beach, if I see trash, I pick it up, I take it with me. I see myself as a steward of the land and myself as an extension to the land that we're on. So I want to just invite you all to think about that for yourselves. So thank you. Next slide. We first wanted to introduce the organization that allows us to do this amazing work, and that is the Humble Independent Practice Association, or the Humble IPA. We're located in Eureka, California, in rural Northern California, about five hours north of San Francisco. In our mission statement, as you see here, we provide our community with the highest quality of healthcare in an efficient, cost-effective manner. This was written in 1994 and it's reevaluated every one or two years. And this is still our guiding direction, even though how we achieve that mission has changed. Our foundational business at the Humble IPA is to be a health plan administrator. We've been a part of the healthcare delivery system here locally since the 60s. We manage several health insurance plans, we process claims, we coordinate care. And we're a for-profit business, which typically gets a bad reputation in healthcare, but our shareholders are local healthcare providers and a majority of our profits are reinvested into the programs that serve our community. 
we're invested in improving the health and well being of our community now and in the future. We offer uh, the Priority Care Center offers primary care, mental health counseling, care coordination, and wellness coaching. And we'll be hearing a lot more about the school based wellness centers today. We know that healthcare is much more than medicine. And our organization formed as medical providers delivering medical services, but we now know that it takes a team to serve the whole person and the community. That's why the Priority Care Center and the school-based wellness centers exist. So a little bit more about our school-based wellness centers. Um, we're currently affiliated with nine schools throughout um, Humboldt County and our county is huge. Um, we have four wellness center sites, and these wellness centers are drop-in centers for students to come in when they need support throughout the day during school hours. And that looks different for every student, also sometimes for each school. Um, but these are confidential drop-in spaces where students can get emergency supplies. They could do conflict mediation with someone maybe they just got into an argument with. Uh, maybe they missed breakfast and they want to get some breakfast to be on their way, or maybe they're having a hard time focusing in class, um, all kinds of things. We also are connected to our classrooms on the campuses that we're in. Um, we do wellness education presentations like this one. We actually have a presentation on vaping, on the effects of cannabis use that we present in the classroom, um, in addition to sex ed, puberty ed, we also work closely with families in their homes to provide them with support. They want connection to referrals in the community for long-term counseling. They need assistance with food security and so on. Um, and then lastly, we have what are called our empowerment groups. And this is a really big component of our program. These are voluntary support groups um, for students where they need more social emotional support. Um, and these groups range from spaces like in our juvenile hall to middle school, high school. Um, they're safe spaces where students can take off the mask, especially we'll see this in our young men's group, and really express their emotions and what they're going through with their peers. Um, and yeah, these are incredible spaces. So we're excited to talk a little bit more about these in the presentation. Our learning objectives today, we heard about the humble IPA. We're going to be talking about what is motivational interviewing or MI, why we use it, core techniques, examples from the field, and then takeaways. Motivational interviewing, as I'm sure a lot of you already know, it's a collaborative conversation, a shared conversation. MI is done for and with a person, not to or on someone. We're not trying to, it's not a way of tricking someone into doing something that we want. The practice was developed by Stephen Rolnick and Bill Miller as a method to support behavioral change. And it strengthens a person's motivations towards their goals by exploring their own reasons for change. We as practitioners create the atmosphere. We're listening for and responding to change talk, and then we help the person make a plan. There's no end goal. We're not trying to make the person do anything because we don't need the person to change. It's their life. It's not ours. And this is a foundation of motivational interviewing, and it's one of the ways that prevents burnout. Burnout. This quote is a big piece of motivational interviewing to me. The skills of MI take years to get comfortable with, but how you make someone feel can start today. And the quote from Maya Angelou, I've learned that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. The spirit of MI is as critical as the skills. As practitioners, our role is to create the atmosphere. We're listening for change talk. We're responding to that. So one of the pieces, collaboration. Again, MI is done with a person, not to them. We're collaborating on something. We're working on it together. It's not, it's not a trick. 
acceptance. The clinician is not judging the other person and understand that the person has autonomy in their life, even when that person's choices are different than our own. That's a hard thing to remember. And it's actually what prevents burnout as well. It's not our choices. We might be doing something different. Compassion. The clinic, clinician wants what's best for the person because change is really hard. And we need to remember that people choose substances in this example for a reason. And evocation. We all have what's needed for change within ourselves. And the people that we're working with also have it within themselves. Our task is to be kind, to be curious, and to call that change forward. In MI, clinicians are not trying to convince the person to change through debate or argument. In fact, the creators, uh, Miller and Rolnick, found that the more you try to convince someone with logic and arguments, the more likely it is that they're going to back off and defend themselves and their position and their reasons for you're just making them 100% positive that they're doing the right thing for them if you start to argue with them for change. So we want MI to be a dance. One person moves and the other person responds. That's flow. You're not tied to the outcome. You're not trying to wrestle someone into what you want. Wrestling is exhausting. And it happens when we start to fight against resistance. This is really difficult to remember, but it's another reason of how we prevent burnout. Wrestling causes burnout. The core skills for MI are open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summary. And we'll go through these on the next slide. Open-ended questions. Could you imagine a coworker returning from vacation and this is how you ask them how it went? Did you go on vacation? Yes. Did you go to Mexico? No. Did you go to Hawaii? No. <laughs> you would never say that. You would just get one piece of information at a time. You would say something like, tell me about your vacation. Then you would get so much more information when you asked the open-ended question. That's exactly the way that we can save time with this te technique. A question was sent in to us um, of how does one best highlight the risk of overdose with substance use at present? And one way to do that is tell me what you know about fentanyl. Another open-ended question. Tell me what you know about the risks of buying pills off social media. Then we're not assuming the person might know the risks, the per and then we can save a little time and start from what they already know. Help me understand is another great way to start a question. Help me understand why your asthma has been acting up this month. Other questions that help move things to the next level because you're helping the person think about the next steps are, what do you think you'll do next? Where, do you, where you, might you wanna go from here? If you wanted to quit smoking, how might you go about it? If you can develop a list of open-ended questions that you like to use on a regular basis, and then you can keep them nearby to review, or maybe have a few go-to open-ended questions that you use all the time, and then maybe you add in a new one every now and then, or you ask your team you know, what go-to questions they typically rely on. Affirmations is the next part of ORS, that acronym. A affirmations, they feel good to hear them. They specifically identify a strength, a value, goal, effort, or success. It recognizes, supports, appreciates, respects, and you remain neutral and genuine in your inflection. There is a big difference between affirming someone and praising them because praise can create an unequal relationship dynamic. An example, a classic example is saying, I'm so proud of you for quitting smoking. And that's exactly the way we might feel. We might feel very proud of that, but that can also make the person feel like they might be letting you down if they relapse. And that could make them stop attending visits. Because if I can be proud of you, I can also be disappointed if a relapse happens, which is common, and relapse is actually part of the change. So to rephrase that praise into an affirmation, you could say something like, you've worked really hard to quit smoking, 
or your health is really important to you. Affirmations start with you, the word you. Reflections are a huge piece of motivational interviewing. They're a powerful way to show a person that we're listening and help them realize their own feelings and needs. Reflections are about listening more and saying less. They help you listen for change talk. That's what you're listening for when you're, when you're talking with someone. And then you reflect it back to them, which lets them hear it. And that's a big part of change. When the person hears their reasons, that's part of how people change. They, they're they like, oh yeah. oh yeah, now that I hear myself saying it, that makes a lot of sense. You can also label emotions, the concept of name it to tame it by Dr. Dan Siegel. It's okay to guess at feelings because they'll correct you. Naming feelings is a big part of uh, what we're trying to communicate. So this example, I like relaxing with my friends, it makes me feel closer to them and like I can go on with my day. But my parents hate my friends. They're always saying my friends are bad for me and I only get in trouble with them. So a simple reflection, you like hanging out with your friends. Simple reflections have value, but deeper reflections, when you can really guess at what's going on, that moves the conversation further. It builds the rapport faster. So some examples of complex reflections, deeper, I'm guessing at the meaning of what this person is saying. Being with your friends helps you relax, but knowing how your parents feel about them makes it difficult to have fun. You love your friends and you're hurt that your parents don't like them. That can make hanging out with them difficult. Or you're looking at both sides. That's another type of a complex reflection. On one hand, you like hanging out with your friends, but on the other, I hear you saying it's affecting your relationship with your parents. Amplified is when you have a rapport with someone. You wouldn't really start out with Amplified because there's a touch of sarcasm, light sarcasm that can come with it. You could say something like, you have no idea why your parents don't like your friends. And then they would say, well, I kind of have an idea of why my parents would be so angry at my friends. You can guess at the feelings and the underlying meanings. You can read those examples. Summaries are a long reflection. They're an opportunity to let the person know that you're really listening and understand what they've shared with you. You can regather your thoughts, transition topics. It's easy to get off topic sometimes and this, a summary can help redirect the conversation. You can also emphasize change talk that you've heard and you're gonna end with an open-ended question. You get to decide what goes in the summary. You can cherry pick, you wanna cherry pick the change talk and you want to really choose the positives, affirming, and what you've heard of the person's reasons for change. So something like, you have a lot going on. And even with all of that, you still wanna meet and work on this. Where should we start? Change, remembering that change is really hard for all of us and being aware of the resistance and rolling with it. And for me, when I recognize that I have entered into some resistance with someone I'm working with, the feeling I get, it's a tightness in my stomach because I am like angry that they aren't doing the things that I think that they should do. Or I'm literally leaning forward, like I, I'm pushing them, I'm urging them. And so that's when you have to recognize that it's happening and sometimes even just apologizing, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I felt like I was pushing you right then or shifting the conversation always expressing empathy, avoid argument. When you notice this resistance, because that's going back to the wrestling, which leads to burnout and exhaustion, resistance is a sign that you need to do something different. Because in the words of one of the founders, uh, Dr. Rolnick, the more you try to insert information and advice onto others, the more they tend to back off and resist. So we just learned what motivational what motivational interviewing is, the spirit of MI, and some basic skills. And now Vanessa is going to share with you how she and her team use these skills. The process, these four processes of MI are engaging. A person in the process, you're building rapport. Then you're focusing the conversation. You're evoking the change talk, which is that person's reasons for change. And then you set the goals. And you notice that engaging is the outermost circle because you keep returning to this. Every time you hit a stumbling block, you go back to engage and build rapport. Every time you stumble into resistance, you go back to engage. Thank you. 
Thank you, Juliet. Thank you for providing us with that foundational language. So um, for the sake of this webinar, we really wanna focus on brief intervention. Sometimes people call this diversion. And brief intervention is an approach that was developed by Ken Winters, and it uses evidence-based um, curriculum, which includes motivational interviewing. It's a short-term counseling intervention for adolescents who use alcohol and other drugs, who have a short history of use, are ambivalent about their change, and have low levels of dependence. Um, the purpose of brief intervention is to encourage the adolescent to take a more active and reflective role when considering their own relationship with substances. The Center for Applied Research and Solutions leads an amazing in-depth training for, on brief intervention, which includes worksheets and handouts. We want to give them some kudos. Um, if you have, are curious about a training specific to BI, um, here is their website for more information on that. Next slide. So I wanted to begin just talking about our process. Um, for us at our school-based wellness center sites, so often we'll receive a referral from a principal, vice principal, counselor, that a student was caught vaping in the bathroom, vaping tobacco products or cannabis. Maybe they showed up to school smelling like cannabis. Uh, maybe their eyes were bloodshot. We'll receive a referral and then um, begin working with the student. We'll try to meet with that student as soon as possible. This typically occurs at school, um, although we do home visits, as I mentioned in, in the beginning of the presentation. We'll introduce ourselves and then we'll go over some overall goals and expectations. We reiterate that this program is about the student and for the student. Um, we stress confidentiality. I'll often say like, Although you've been referred to me um, from the principal, Miss Landy, for example, what you are going to share with me is between us, and it's really about you and your usage. Um, sometimes I have to reiterate that a lot. If I don't have a relationship with the student, it's strange for them to be talking with an adult about their substance use. They're like not used to it at all, which makes sense. Um, and then I stress that we're not here to make them change. It's completely up to them. So for the first couple sessions, we really focus on building rapport. Um, unless we already have it with the student, maybe we've met with them for something else on campus, anxiety, something else, conflict mediation. Um, otherwise, it's really important that we build that rapport. And sometimes that can look like getting to know the student, their likes, dislikes, their culture, which can influence the brief intervention. Um, for example, if the student's first language is Spanish, then we want somebody to potentially deliver the brief intervention in Spanish, um, if that student would like that. It's all um, student-led in that way. And then we meet with the student for up to about six times, and then we offer follow-up meetings um, within two weeks to see how they're doing with their goals. So when we begin, we really wanna talk with them about the pros and cons of their use. These are some open-ended questions that I use. Um, I'll ask, what are some things that you like about your substance of choice? And usually students are, again, really surprised when you ask them. They're like, what? You know, did you mean to ask me this? Um, but this is very intentional. It's important for us to understand what they like about their substance of um, choice. Um, and then we encourage them to be completely honest. Sometimes if a student's stumped, We'll share maybe what another student shared. Of course, we would never say that person's name, but sometimes I'll hear this. Um, often it's things like smell, the feel of the device maybe that they're using, um, things like that, uh, maybe bringing them closer to their peers. And then we'll ask the student, what are some things you don't like about your substance of choice? Um, they'll usually have something here relating to their health or sometimes the way other people perceive them for using the substance. Um, and then this is usually where I'll ask the student how long they've been using and try and get a deeper understanding about their use in the first place. So I've got to drink water between all my talking. Um, it is usually something deeper than the friend. A friend and I were just curious. Maybe they'll say that. Um, I actually heard that yesterday. It was my 11th birthday and I, did, I felt like drinking was too much. So I was like, 
I'm going to go for vaping. So um, that's where you've really got to dial in your face because sometimes we'll hear things, as you all know, where you're like, oh my goodness. Um, but then when they get kind of beyond that initial reason why, it's usually something deeper. If there's habitual use that it's a reoccurrence that's helping the student cope. So again, that's where it's nice to ask them about their initial reason for using. Then I'll ask, um, what were you doing before using your substance of choice? Um, get curious here. Use a ton of reflections. Sometimes we'll hear students say things like, oh, well, when I was um, upset, I would go out for walks in the forest. I would play with makeup and do a bunch of costume makeup. I'd watch movies. I'd listen to music. You're going to return to whatever the student is sharing with you later on in your brief intervention. So it's great to try to understand what they were doing before they started to engage and rely on that substance. So then I'll ask, what are some good things about continuing to use as much and as often um, as you have been using? So um, sometimes students will get stuck here. Um, sometimes they'll talk about the benefits of um, keeping their friends. Oh, I'd, I'd maintain the same friend group if I um, were to use as much and as often as I have been. Um, yeah, sometimes this, this question will stump them. Again, I mentioned rapport building and Juliet was talking about this earlier. You'll see on the slides, the engaging part. Um, maybe during the rapport building or throughout your sessions, if you know this student or don't know the answers to this, ask them about their goals. So sometimes students will share things like, um, one of my goals is to graduate high school or to have a good self-care routine or be financially stable. So you can use this question, the what are some good things about continuing to use as much and as often as you have been and kind of flip it depending on their goal. You could say, um, so you mentioned that your goal is to graduate high school. If you were to continue to use three times a day, maybe that's something they said, um, for the next five years, how do you think that would impact your goal to graduate high school? Um, when I was preparing for this presentation, I was reaching out to different students and kind of asking their thoughts, advice um, for you all, for providers. And one student said that she felt like really hearing that and playing the tape um, really helped that discomfort that arose of, gosh, if I were to really use three times a day, her substance abuse was cannabis, and I really want to graduate high school, for her to play that tape out and think about that, that discomfort really helped propel her to reduce her use. So that was something I thought I would share with you all as a tip from our youth. Um, but of course, if you are gonna use that, this idea of playing the tape, we always wanna have empathy. We never wanna judge the student when they're talking with us about their substance use. Another component is um, what are some things that might get worse if I continue to use as much and as often as I do? This is where students might begin exploring addiction. Um, addiction is a strong word, and most people don't want any association with the word because of stigma. And they'll say, I'm, I'm not addicted. I could stop using right now if I wanted to. And depending on the student, I'll challenge them. Um, or I'll ask them if they've tried cutting back and why don't they stop? Um, you know, questions around that with addiction. I'm, in our area in Humboldt County, we have really high rates of addiction, high rates of substance use compared to the rest of the state. So this is something I'm always thinking about is um, supporting students with understanding addiction, the dangers of addiction, and how certain substances can lead to other substances perhaps later on in their life. Um, and then just a reminder that if a young person begins to argue with you, you know, Juliet mentioned this about resistance earlier. This is not a mine. And then you'd want to pull back. Um, we don't ever want to label or shame the youth. This is also meaning like don't preach to them about how their behavior is wrong. You're really just trying to get curious about them and their history. You're laying out the pros and cons of their use. And our role is just always to be there and support. Um, yeah. So, and then this might be a good place to set a goal. 
since it is one of your first meetings potentially with the student for considering the building rapport session. So um, you're gonna ask them, you know, what would it look like for them to cut back? How much would they like to cut back? How will they achieve this? And you're going to support whatever the goal they set for themselves um, because they'll be more likely to be successful. So now we're gonna talk about triggers. Um, so here, first off, we wanna try and define triggers in a way that they'll understand. And I will say triggers are sometimes people, places, things, smells that can cause unwanted or unexpected feelings. And that's usually a way that I've noticed that teens will understand what I'm talking about. And I really explained that triggers, understanding them is big. Um, it's a lifelong journey. They can change over time. And it's so powerful when youth can begin to gain awareness around their own triggers. And it's painful sometimes when they realize that maybe their friends or their family are their triggers. Um, common triggers we will hear are the packaging, the smell of a product, being in places where they would use normally, uh, feeling certain emotions like anxiety, boredom, depression, being alone, the weekends can be a trigger. Um, I was working with a young person who shared that um, she had, her grandparents were um, using cannabis. This was her substance of choice. And she shared that although they weren't using it around her because they knew that she was doing brief intervention with me, um, they would use it during the day and they would smoke in the house. And she knew that when she would come home and she would smell it in the house, that would be a trigger for her. And so um, once we un understood those triggers, we would role play. So we role played her approaching her grandparents and saying, hey, grandpa, you know that I'm, I'm doing diversion, brief intervention with Vanessa. And um, I just wanted to say like, if there's any way that you could smoke maybe outside before I come home, it might be a little bit easier for me. And that was really hard for her to do, but she did it. Um, and it's different for every person, every kid. Um, yeah, so that's just one example. And then we wanna, of course, um, once we know these triggers, we wanna create alternative actions. So I mentioned earlier in the beginning, you're asking students, you know, what did you use before you started or do before you started to use the substance? Um, and you wanna plug in, so if they shared a trigger for them, you could plug in an alternative action, which could be something like going for a walk, something they used to do, watch a movie, call a friend. So the next we've got um, social support. So who is in the student support circle? We want them to try and name some people. If they don't have anyone, we wanna explore with them ways um, to try and make new friends. It's important that maybe they have someone in their lives that isn't using their substance of choice. Um, and maybe they're sharing with the people in their lives, hey, like, you know that I got caught smoking weed in the bathroom and now I have to see Vanessa every Thursday. Um, I really am trying to cut back uh, and role playing with them. What would it look like to actually ask for help around that? Sometimes they'll, they'll hate the role playing. It's the most corny thing ever, right? But for them to practice it and make sure that they have a couple of tools in their toolbox of what they will say is really important um, and will help make them more successful in their journey with cutting back. Um, and then, yeah, so I mentioned, when will they ask for help? What does that look like? Um, and, and really encouraging them to tell people um, that they are cutting back. I mentioned if they don't have friends in their circles, that's where we internally, like we would utilize our empowerment groups that I mentioned earlier, encourage them to attend an empowerment group to make new friends. Um, there's wonderful activity guides in our community. I'm sure they're in yours of uh, places and opportunities to make friends as well. But you really wanna troubleshoot any of these areas with them from triggers to social supports to goals, make sure that they feel confident. Now we're moving on to setting goals. So we're gonna ask the student, what might get in the way of you might being able to make some of these changes in your life? So what are some things that you can do to be successful in these difficult situations when barriers arise? 
Um, again, this could be a great opportunity for role playing. Um, and then we wanna revisit who can help the student. We're only there for such a short amount of time. So we're really trying to think big picture um, with their goals and praise them. If they've set something small to us, it might be small. They went from smoking three times a day to maybe once a day. That's great. We want to, you know, it sounds like you set a realistic goal for yourself. Wow. You know, we really want to praise them and offer them some encouragement because all goals are great, um, even if they're small. And after the six sessions, we, again, I mentioned that we do follow up visits with them. And this might be a good time just to see how they're doing. Do they need to change their goal? Is their goal working for them? Um, maybe where were some areas that they could have improved? So this, yeah, this piece is important, um, especially with supporting youth, because this could be a lifelong journey for some of our students. So it's always nice to hear how they're doing with the goals they set for themselves. Now we're gonna just share some things that we've learned. So um, one of the biggest things that I've learned is to really be authentic. So, um, and to me, it's also taking delight in the students that we work with. Um, I, I forget where I heard this or read this, but um, you know, students read us, they read our faces, they read our body language. I really do try and take delight within that first 10 seconds, that's what I was referencing, um, of that interaction of just being so happy to see them. You wanna take delight in them. They feel that. You don't wanna fake the funk. That's like, you are there to be there and be their support person. Um, be authentic. If you feel like, oh gosh, maybe I know like this student's family, we live in a really small community, or maybe this student's family knows my mom or some situation like that, you might want to pass that student along to another service provider at your school. Because again, that student will feel that energy from you and they won't uh, be able to go as deep in the motivational interviewing process. There's a barrier around the connection and the relationship they potentially could or could not have with you. Um, and then we want to mirror their language. So at the beginning of this, Julia used the word relaxing. Um, I had brought that up in our example because sometimes they won't say, I like, I like vaping with my friends, you know? I mean, even hearing that, it's not something that they're going to say. They might use code words like, I like to relax with my friends. So, and we know in this situation what the code word is, right? Relax. So we would mirror their language always throughout whatever word they're using. Um, even yesterday, still sometimes I get caught on the word vape. I'm like, are they using this word? And I'll ask the student if they're using something else, I'll use that word. I'll ask, is it okay if I use that word? Um, it kind of makes them feel like they're in charge of this process too, which is really important with building trust. Um, we also want to tamper any expectations so relapse is a part of change. Um, they, may, this, they may come back to us a few times. So for us in our wellness centers, we're the first um, point of access, depending on, again, if, um, so for us, it's short-term use, but if they've been using habitually for a long time, they might utilize a different resource. But relapse is a part of change and it's, it's likely that it could happen. So harm reduction is our goal. Um, it, it's not, we're not here to condone them, but we want to encourage the youth to find what will work for them. And I know that um, that might not be appropriate for every school site, every wellness center, but this is what we use and this is our model and, and this is what has worked for us. And then um, language. So language is always evolving. Um, we want to be humble. If students correct us, uh, you know, Vanessa, who uses the word vape or whatever word they're using, or maybe use incorrect pronouns, um, we want to be humble. We are all growing. If a student corrects you for something that you said, accept the correction and move on. We're always modeling to our youth. That's why we're here. And ultimately, um, change is up to them. And I feel like it's an honor that we get to be a part of that process of one step, one piece where we get to really see that student, 
relish them, take delight in them, support them, love on them. And then hopefully some of the tools that we give them with understanding their triggers, knowing how to create goals, who's in their support system, will all be tools in their toolbox that they can use for the rest of their lives. So thank you. Um, if you'd like to stay connected with us, you could reach us on IG at Humboldt IPA Wellness Centers. And then this is our website, HumboldtIPA.com. And you'll find our school-based wellness programs page there. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll move on to questions now. We got a couple of questions in the group chat. So I'm happy to ask our presenters those questions. So first off, how do you address if the adults in the home are using drugs slash alcohol? Yeah, this comes up quite a bit. Um, so it's really unique to the student. Great question, actually, first of all. Um, sometimes we'll hear students that are maybe using or parents that are using with their student, which is really unfortunate and painful. Um, I actually just heard a story this last week about a parent who had found out their child was vaping and supplied them with vapes because they felt like, oh, well, now I know what they're using and at least I know they're not out in the community partying and making other bad choices. Um, so without having a relationship with that parent, I would never go in and say, you know, shame on you because we know how that's going to go. If someone's going to express shame or frustration towards us, we're going to shut down. So um, if it's a situation where it's putting the child in harm um, in some way, maybe they're being neglected because of the substance use, or again, maybe the parent is offering it to them and doing it with them, then that might be a situation where we have to include child welfare in the process. Um, it's unfortunate when that happens, but if that does happen, I want to encourage everyone to be really transparent with the families and the students that you're working with. Um, it's awful when you're caught off guard and you're completely surprised and you share something with someone and all of a sudden CWS is at your door. So um, when you're establishing those beginning um, sessions with that student, and then you um, actually didn't mention this, but you're also it's assumed, but um, we do this. The principal calls the family and says, hey, so-and-so was caught in the bathroom. Now they're gonna do you know, diversion with Vanessa because they were caught smoking in the bathroom. So then we would reach out to the parent. Hey, I'm Vanessa, you know, how do you feel about your student doing this? So um, there is an opportunity for some relationship there, but I don't know, Juliet, there's so much I could say about this question. It's really unique. Um, to the student and the family. Julia, is there anything you would add? No, I think that you answered it perfectly. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you for that, Vanessa. Um, another question is, uh, what ages can uh, we use brief intervention for adolescents? So can this be used with second, third, or fourth graders? Wow, I haven't done it with second, third, and fourth graders. I'm giving the face because I'm like, oh God, our second, third, and fourth graders using substances. But yes, in some situations they are. Um, I think so. You know, I think as long as you tailor the language in such a way that they can understand it, um, then yeah, absolutely. I'm, for us today and the purposes of this presentation, we're talking about sixth grade to 12th grade. Um, but it could totally apply to college students in a dorm setting. Um, and it could apply to elementary school students if some of the language was changed to a way that they could understand. Thank you for that. And then the other questions are, how long are each session? And is it six session and then one hour each? Yeah, it's about an hour um, each time. And I would say, I usually take up the whole period, but I also gauge it on the student. Um, if, and I set that expectation, hey, normally we meet this for this amount of time, for this long, they know in the very beginning. But um, if something comes up that's really painful, uh, I recognize that like, I'm with them for only an hour on Wednesday and I'm literally sometimes, not literally, okay, figuratively, not literally everyone, ripping them open, their hearts open. 
And they're telling me all these things about their trauma and their use. And maybe their mom started using with them. You know, when they were 10, they had their first edible. And then I'm going to sew them back up and they're going to go back to class and carry on like everything's okay. So depending on the things that they share, I might draw it out because that meeting that we just had asking about their initial reasons for using substances was really raw. So that's where you all know as people on this call, I'm sure that it's so important to meet people where they're at. So if you sense any rawness, then it's okay to stop and it's okay to extend a session longer. It's okay. We're not married to the six sessions. It's just a guide. So that's what we do right now. Thank you for that. And then another question, could this be done in a small group setting or is this individual only? I think it could be done in a small group setting. Um, again, you'd have to really build trust. You know, we have our empowerment groups, which are small groups, um, but we spend a lot of different um, sessions on building trust, creating group agreements, um, ground rules. So as long as you were able to really express the group agreements, um, which the students would develop themselves around confidentiality, um, then I think it could be done in small groups. But, um, you know, substance use, it's, it's a pretty, like I was talking about addiction earlier and how stigmatized that word is and heavy that word is. Um, it's very personal to some people. So I would just make sure that you had the right group and that the trust was there. Everybody felt comfortable. You were going to decide to do it in that kind of modality. Um, and then I would say like in the same vein that it, um, if you are thinking about doing this on your campuses, making sure that the person that would be doing it is more of a neutral person. I wouldn't have the principal of the school doing it or someone that's more of a disciplinarian or punishes people. Um, I would definitely like it's more for a coach or um, a teacher where there's more of a maybe a balance of power. Um, I think that you'd be more likely to be successful in getting some honest answers. Awesome. So we have so many questions coming in. Just show. Oh man, Juliet, feel free to take any. <laughs> like, I know I'm just like going for them. Yes. Um. First off, yes, the uh, the recording and slides will be shared to all folks. So just reminding everyone again, because we do get a couple of those questions in. Um. And then the next question for our presenter is: Is there a train um training of the trainer uh model uh, for this MI model? If so, um, they're interested in it. Yeah, um, I put that it's in the earlier portion of the slides, but um, there is a group that offers a brief intervention training. It's two days. It's um, around, well, Pacific Standard Time. It's, I believe it's like 8 to 1230. It's free. It's online. They'll provide you with um, some handouts and resources that include even some of these open-ended questions. And it's really a guide. So there is a training. And when Tracy sends out the slides, you'll have the um, web address in there. Awesome. So we're good with that. And then the next question is, do you include parents slash support system in some sessions? How do you work with parents and the support systems that are not supportive of their change? Yeah, I guess these all, all are for me, Juliet. <laughs> all these questions. So great questions, everybody. Um, so I have not um, necessarily included parents in the process. I feel like there's still, sometimes parents are really supportive. Um, sometimes parents are not supportive, but there's still that power differential there. And MI really is about the person, right? So sometimes, especially in that parent-child relationship, we're more attached to the outcome. Oh my God, my kid still wants to smoke once a day. I wanted it to be zero. So um, that person's really not a neutral person. And so I wouldn't include the parent in that process. I could share with the parent if the child let me, hey, you know, Kenny started doing brief intervention. He's doing great. Um, these are some things that he felt like would be important for you to know um, if he gave me permission to do that. And then the second part was if they're not supportive, Tracy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm assuming not supportive in the way of like, maybe their student want, like wanting them to continue using, I guess I'm not understanding that part. I guess 
most parents are pretty supportive. This is what I've observed, or they're checked out completely. And so I'll see that too, where they're like, I don't care or whatever, meet with Vanessa because maybe they themselves are using. Um, and although that is so painful, like we can't take on the responsibility of, of that. Um, Juliet mentioned burnout. We can't make people change. Uh, we may know that, God, it would sure be great if this parent supported this child, but um, we don't know if that's going to happen. But you're there. You're there to support that student. And that's really special. Um, I think that is our most recent question. But if there's any more questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, can I just go ahead and share my screen really quick? So if one of you can stop screen sharing. Um, I want to make sure I'm sharing this information with folks right here. So again, I know there's you know probably more questions to come and we welcome them. Here are some uh, email addresses, mine as well, our two presenters there. Um, if you guys have any further questions you want to um, ask us, but also I wanna make sure to let you know that again, we'll be having the fourth part of our five part um, to be webinar and in-person in training series at our in-person conference in Sacramento on Monday, April 17th. So please check us out um, if you're interested in joining us for the fourth part of this. But again, um, you do not need to attend all five part of our um, to be webinar in-person training series. You can just attend the one that makes sense for your schedule and the one that is of interest to you. Um, uh, so I hope you all enjoyed today's webinar. I certainly learned a lot from our two amazing presenters today. Um, also, I want to make sure I'm highlighting this for you all, but when you leave our webinar today, an automatic evaluation will pop up on your end. It's only five multiple choice questions. Please fill it out for us. That will help us improve future webinars. And then otherwise than that, let me check the group chat really quick. Lots of thank yous um, and amazing presentation uh, remarks for our presenters. Uh, so I wanted to make sure our presenters know that. Otherwise than that, thank you so much for joining us today, folks. Um, we hope you found this webinar helpful. Please take care, everyone. Stay safe, stay dry. Thank you, everyone.